Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining TSRA's webinar this evening on ongoing trials which may revolutionize cardiovascular medicine. Um, this is sponsored by Atricure. Uh, we are joined today by a very strong group of panelists that really does not need much introduction. Um, I'll start by um, introducing myself. My name is Urbas Mead. I'm a cardiothoracic surgery resident, ISICS resident at Yale, also education chair of TSRA. Um, I am joined by Dr. Sophia Alexis, who is an integrated cardiothoracic surgery resident at Mount Sinai uh, School of Medicine. She will be moderating this um, with me. Um, and to introduce our panelists, we have first Dr. Roxana Meran. She is um, Professor of Medicine in Cardiology and Population Health Science and Policy at um, School of Medicine in Mount Sinai and also the Director of Cardiovascular Research and Clinical Trials and um, Director of Women's Heart and Vascular Center. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have Dr. Arnar Gerson, who is also joining us from Yale. He is the Chief of Cardiac Surgery, um, also the Director of Heart Failure, Transplant and Mechanical Support, and also Director of Robotic Cardiac Surgery um, at Yale. Thank you very much, Dr. Gerson. Um, we have with us Dr. Kendra Grubb joining us all the way at 1 a.m. from Malaga, Spain. Thank you so much for joining us in, in between your tough connection. We are, we truly appreciate it. She is a professor at Emory University and director of the Structural Heart and Valve Program there. And unfortunately, Dr. Griffith could not make it tonight due to some unexpected obligations. Um, so we'll plan on discussing our trials anyway. and. Um, go from there. I'll hand over to Dr. Alexis to start with the first trial. Thank you so much. So we're going to start by talking about the PROGRESS trial. So what the PROGRESS trial is looking to do, it's a study that started in 2021 and the enrollment is estimated and the trial estimated to go until 2037. So it's looking at patients with moderate aortic stenosis and signs of cardiac damage or dysfunction who also have anatomy that's appropriate for transfemoral transcatheter access. So the um, patient enrollment is looking to be about 750 patients randomized one-to-one -to, -one to getting a TAVR with a Sapien 3 or Sapien 3 Ultra platform versus clinical surveillance. Um, primary endpoint, death, stroke, um, unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization at two years with annual follow-up through 10 years. So here is a little more about the study design, perspective, randomized, controlled, multi-center um, with primary composite endpoint as we discussed and some secondary endpoints such as LV mass index, stroke volume index, um, pro BNP measurements and um, reduction in LV EF from baseline. Inclusion criteria, so patients 65 years uh, and older with moderate aortic stenosis at the time of randomization, and then the signs of damage or cardiac dysfunction. Exclusion criteria are as listed, so if a patient cannot get a transcatheter valve for a reason, let's say their annulus is too big or too small or their coronary height is too low, then they would be excluded. Um, if their peripheral vasculature is not amenable to a transfemoral approach, or if their valve is unicuspid or bicuspid, if they have severe AI, prior aortic um, prosthesis, or if they've had a um, BAV. And then for EF, it's pretty liberal inclusion criteria. So the only exclusion with EF is less than 20%. Um, so just to you know, start some conversation about this study, uh, Right now, there's only a 2B recommendation for surgical aortic valve replacement when patients are undergoing cardiac surgery for other reasons. So Dr. Grubb, can you talk a little bit about why you think there's this push to treat moderate aortic stenosis by transcatheter therapy? Sure. So first off, we have to be reminded that the guidelines, their level of evidence is, is based on what studies we've done. 
And so it's not saying that you shouldn't treat moderate aortic stenosis. It's just that we have not studied it sufficiently to um, accumulate a body of knowledge that supports a class one indication. So I just wanna make sure that that's very clear. Um, we know from um, longitudinal patient studies that moderate aortic stenosis is not a benign disease. And in fact, if we, if we follow these patients without treatment at all, we find that their mortality is higher. And so I think that the reason to go forward with this is, is that there is an unmet need. We don't yet know which patients will have myocardial damage, even though they only have moderate aortic stenosis. We know that those patients don't survive, but we haven't figured out exactly who is the best candidate. So now that we have a therapy, um, TAVR, that is less invasive and so far proven to be safe, then it is important that we actually study this. Now, whether or not they got the age right and 65 is where we should start with this, that's a whole nother conversation. There's certainly data to suggest that these patients, at least some of them, will do better long-term if we treat them earlier. Thank you for that. You know, I, I guess my question would also be, I wish that there would be a surgical arm because we've seen from the TAVR explant study that, you know, 40% of these balloon expandable valve patients with an explant would need root replacement, which is not a benign thing. And the you know, mortality and morbidity numbers and stroke seem to be higher with that. So um, I do agree, moderate aortic stenosis is something that we do need to study. And I think if any person given the option of a less invasive therapy versus surgery, um, had a choice, the patient would probably choose the less invasive therapy. I just worry a little bit, I guess, about the downstream effect. Well, I, I will uh, take that and then certainly would wish to hear from the other panelists. But um, I think that the issue here about explant TAVR is that we have to be careful when we're looking at the patient population. There were a large number of patients in explant TAVR that had endocarditis. So that's a little bit different than just a failed valve that needed to be replaced. Mm -hmm. There were also a large number of patients that had concomitant disease. And we know that a, a redo AVR MVR is a very different surgery than just a redo AVR. I ultimately agree with you, especially in our 65 year old patients, I wish that it had a surgical arm, a comparator, um, because we don't have durability data for our low risk patients. But um, at least in, in this um, progress trial, they're attempting to gather, gather the data and patients you know, will be informed. They will have the opportunity for shared decision-making and it's either wait and watch or have their, have their option of a 50% chance of getting the valve. So I, I get the sense that most patients are going to probably want the valve. Um, explanting them later, that is going to be uh, an unknown. We don't know who's going to fail and how early but I don't know that the root replacement um, incidence is going to be as high as what we saw in Explant Tavern. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Gerson, what do you think of this study? No, I think it's an interesting and it is an important study. I mean, I think, uh, I think it's worth pointing out when you look at these trials we're presenting in discussion here, I mean, some of them are industry driven and, and I think you have to take them uh, you mean look at it that from that standpoint. Uh, uh, obviously, these studies would not be done without industry sponsorship. I don't believe this trial would have happened uh, otherwise. Uh, uh, so it, it's you know so they provide a really important uh, mechanism to do these type of trials. You know, but you know how it was designed exactly. People can't be critical about maybe it should have been seventy five years or older. You know, I don't believe that one of the endpoints is, is uh, requiring a pacemaker, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I mean, I think you know these trials are designed to get specific results that are sometimes a bit biased, and we just have to take it. But you know, they're, they're, these are also, I think, uh, whatever the results out of this is, there will be some hypotheses that come out of this. I, I, I was generating, this wouldn't be generated without doing this trial. This could change. I'm not sure. I mean, it's, it's true. It's going to be difficult to argue 
for a randomized trial for moderate aortic stenosis with minimal evidence, you know, sur you know surgical arm. So I, I, my suspicion is that, you know, if this is a positive trial for favors uh, early TAVR, uh, TAVR for moderate stenosis, you know, we're probably not going to be able to say that people should have surgical that AVR for moderate stenosis based on that results, but one can debate about that. Yeah, I mean, I think we just got to the point in the last couple of years where we see uh, benefit in treating asy asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis with surgical valves. Um, so we have, uh, I think uh, that we'll see a lot of changes in therapies in the upcoming years, but it would be nice to see medical versus transcatheter versus surgical in maybe an older population where this would be the last you know, therapy they'd get. Yeah, I mean, I think it is also important. I mean, I think I'm hoping, and this will I mean there's a fair amount of patients. I'm sure there will be identified subgroup. Of, I mean, because if you look at the survival for untreated uh, moderate aortic stenosis, it, there's there's a difference. You know, the curves separate for mild, moderate, uh, severe, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. And there might be a subgroup of patient who would be benefit from it and should be treated earlier than not. So maybe some of those. Although I don't think this designed within the trial, but there might be some indications that we can, uh, you know, there'll be some spin-offs off of this thing. Yeah, I guess, I wanted, you know, I wanted to just add a couple of things here, uh, just so that uh, I, I realize, you know, that it may seem like it's a biased trial and that companies or whatever, whatever was mentioned regarding the, um, the 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 design of this study, but I think what I think it is important to take a step back and understand that this isn't just all moderate aortic stenosis. It's patients with signs and symptoms and some evidence of cardiac damage or dysfunction. And the idea of are we really classifying aortic stenosis in the best possible way? And I think that there is a very, very nice new classification that Philippe Genero has come up with in really understanding what kind of L, uh, left ventricular remodeling and, and left ventricular dysfunction or cardiac damage is associated with different kinds of valvular heart disease. And I think it's important to kind of put that in that context. Now, having said that, in a younger patient with moderate aortic stenosis with some evidence of cardiac dysfunction, I think it's hard pressed to say without any evidence that now we're gonna we're gonna do a, a a major invasive procedure. So this exactly as you said, Dr. Gerson, I think is a way to kind of at the very least see, say should we be intervening earlier rather than later in these patients, and let's understand that with the use of uh, a transcatheter approach that would be at least at the very least somewhat ethical. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, because there are no guidelines. This has never been studied. And it kind of opens the way to better understanding of the timing of surgery for aortic stenosis uh, and even moderate aortic stenosis. And we are already know that there is also for severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis, there is a, there's a study ongoing as well. So I think um, it's important to at the very least put that in the context of why this trial is so very important in our understanding of the timing of, of, of intervention. Now, whether it would, should be surgical versus and the lifetime management of aortic stenosis, I don't think is dependent on age, but rather the patient. And, um, you know, we, we know that not all 65-year-olds are created equal and neither are all 85-year-olds. So I think we need to kind of really kind of put that in. I don't like the age category whatsoever. I find that to be very misleading. Uh, because it really isn't taking the patient's uh, comorbidities or lack thereof into consideration. And I think then comes, and a much more important evaluation is the lifetime management of patients with aortic stenosis, the timing to surgery, where they are, is it moderate aortic stenosis with some LV dysfunction where something needs to be done? And then of course, the next step is, should this be surgery versus um uh, transcatheter approach. And then uh, after that, what should happen to these patients sort of over a long period of time. So, I mean, I just want to make sure that the context is right, that, that um, these investigators are really trying to better understand the pathobiology of this uh, very important entity. Yeah, I, I, agree Dr. yeah I, I agree with Dr. Mary. I mean, it's uh, uh, totally, and, and it is an important trial. I, I mean, I think there's other thing worth 
pointing out, I mean, I think definition of severe or critical aortic stenosis is pretty clear by most diagnostic studies, you know, from in some what was in the trials. I mean, you're getting into a more gray area and it would be important to see how that pans out. I mean, how do you really define moderate aortic stenosis, you know? Uh, and 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 uh, and and that you know and, and there are subgroups of those patients, as you said, that will benefit more from this. So just just jumping off the discussion, is I say this trial comes to a completion, and some of our hypotheses in terms of you know the outcomes are reasonable with the with the TAVR in these patients, and you are presented with a sixty six year old patient in clinic. Um, with moderate stenosis, what will your discussion be with such a patient? Um, how would you advise them, and what what would be the thought process here? So, and and what would be the consideration for young bicuspid aortic valve patients? They're excluded in these trials, but in this trial, but in the future, is there any consideration about the way these patients should be managed? Um, would the results of this trial be applicable to them? And you know, um, what are what are the future directions from this? To put it simply, yeah, you packaged a lot into that question, so yeah. I will try to address a little bit at a time. Let's first take your first question of about your sixty-six-year-old tri-leaflet valve. Um, I think that's the conversation we're already having. If a patient presents with aortic stenosis and symptoms and is 66 years old, the conversation won't change based on the results of this trial if they're moderate or severe if this trial is positive. It just means that my echo parameters for being able to treat them are slightly less than what they are now. And, and frankly, a lot of patients will come to our clinics with high calcium scores that are not in the guidelines and numbers on their echo that are close. You know, what do you do with a with a mean gradient of 39, right? I mean, is that really is that really moderate? Probably not. And so we're already seeing these patients. We're already um, discussing these in the heart team. But what I think this does is make it really, really important that we focus on shared decision making. That the patient needs to understand that we have limited data in this space. That this will be one trial that provides evidence, whatever it provides. And then we need to help guide them and what the, the best decision for them is. They will still have the option for open surgery if they were to believe that that is a better treatment for them, even with a positive result for the PROGRESS trial. It's the conversation that's the most important. And as Roxana said, we're finding patients for the trial who are already symptomatic and that we believe it's due to aortic stenosis. And so it's a little bit different question than just 65-year-olds off the street. Your second part about bicuspid valves, that's, that's you know, inherent in the data that we have for trileaflet valves is that we have not explicitly studied bicuspids in randomized control trials. Maybe this will um, call into question the need for that, but at least with the newer generation valves, we've pretty much shown that the data for the trileaflet valves and the bicuspid valves is similar. Um, the low risk has, uh, both low risk trials have arms for bicuspids and we're not seeing worse outcomes. And so I, I think that for um, most bicuspids, you're going to find that they're going to fall into these categories. The Seaver zeros, the unicuspids, those are different, um, but we, we approach those a little bit differently. Other thoughts? I mean, well, I think... What you were saying, Dr. Ron, there's a big, big, big difference in like a 65 year old on dialysis with an STS score of seven versus someone who has, you know, a little bit of a diminished ejection fraction, some signs of some signs of symptoms, but you know, is STS score of 1.5. You know, I, I, I don't, I first of all, I don't think that the results of this particular trial, even if like we have all of the data available that will absolutely change how we would be approaching these patients today. I mean, it's too few number of patients. 
It's one study. It's moderate aortic stenosis. It's with people with some cardiac damage. This kind of a study has never been done before. So I don't think this one trial is going to change how we are going to approach these patients, but rather give us sort of a, an understanding of the, the next steps towards what to do with these patients, because there is, as Dr. Grubb explained, there is no guideline because it's never been done before. Now, putting it all together, that's what a heart team is for, right? That you bring this patient comes to a heart team and is evaluated by the team that wants to take care of this patient that has very, very good procedures to do this, as well as medical management of these patients. But very, very importantly, is the uh, the procedural or uh, transcatheter versus surgical um, uh, replacement of the aortic valve. And I think at that point, it really does have to do with what the team believes, and by the way, what the patient wants. And by the way, what's the life expectancy and what's their uh, home environment and everything else that goes into that kind of a decision-making process in terms of what to do next and what, what they would be approached with. Because if they're 65 young and vibrant and with nothing else, uh, those patients, we tell them that, look, we, we believe that you would do well. We have a lot of data. You would do well on both, both uh, effects, but we have better options most likely for you if you had the surgical valve first. And then mm -hmm. if should that fail, we could, we could go with a, with a transcatheter approach. That's for now. 10 years from now, it could be that our transcatheter approaches have gotten so much better that we don't have to worry about access to the coronary arteries and all these other issues that we currently worry about for the valve and valve procedures that a patient like this might have to encounter. So I think it's a little bit of a premature question at this time to ask that. And then bicuspid aortic valve is a completely different story. It all has to do whether there's aortopathy. I'm always concerned about aortopathy. And in terms of, even if I don't see it, I really want the, my surgeons to look at those patients and to evaluate the aorta, aorta and the aortic root with whatever the imaging processes that are there, and then talk to the patient, depending on their longevity, et cetera. Uh, so far, I've um, most of my young, vibrant, bicuspid valve patients have gone for surgical uh, 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 intervention with uh, some aortic, um, you know, like Bental procedures, et cetera. So I think it all has to do with all uh, that is in front of us and what the heart team and how the heart team approaches these patients. Right. I think we're also spoiled. We're in an institution with Dr. Stelzer and Dr. El Hamamzi, and we have the option for valve sparing roots and Rosses and a lot of different therapies for uh, young patients with aortic disease and aortopathies. Um, I just want to switch gears if there's uh, no other comments about the PROGRESS trial um, to actually uh, your TWILIGHT trial. Um, that came out in New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago. Um, at, it took place at 187 sites. Uh, 11 countries with over 7,000 patients randomized. Um, so what the TWILIGHT trial was looking at was patients who received a drug-eluting stent and had um, at least one clinical or one angiographic high-risk feature for ischemic or bleeding after, and then after a three-month period of dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI switched to either um, ticagrelor plus aspirin or ticagrelor plus placebo. Um, looking at a primary endpoint of BARC uh, types two, three, five bleeding. So hemodynamically significant bleeding, drop in hemoglobin. Um, and the endpoint was met in 4% of the patients with the monotherapy versus over 7% with the um, dual therapy. So it looks like the monotherapy won out after um, three months. So can you talk to us a little bit about the current state of anticoagulation practice in your patients who you're performing PCI on? Thank you for uh, putting up uh, the Twilight study up front. I think it's a one of the many multitudes of clinical trials that interventional cardiologists who are very data-driven have done in understanding what's the optimal uh, dual antiplatelet therapy or single antiplatelet therapy in patients undergoing PCI. And I think the idea is how can we achieve um, a, a relative um, 
uh, ischemic benefit without um, bleeding harm. And what we did here with this potent agent questioned the need of aspirin in, in, in combination with ticagrelor in a way to say is less actually more in patients for undergoing PCI, can we preserve the ischemic benefit, but also keep the patients away from the harm of bleeding? Because when you have a potent agent such as ticagrelor, which is a thionopyridine um, that is um, a, um, a reversible, it's a reversible P2, not a thionopyridine, but a P reversible P2Y12 inhibitor, can we be able to actually um, uh, keep that and preserve? What, what is aspirin doing in combination with a potent agent around? And we found uh, understandably that uh, actually it was the only thing it was doing is keeping the patient from bleeding because the most important part of this trial was the, the and the reason why we needed 7,119 plus patients was to be sure that this was a safe thing to do to withdraw aspirin. And uh, at the moment, aspirin indefinitely as the single antiplatelet therapy is a class one indication indefinitely for our patients. And so what this is doing now is questioning whether that should be aspirin or maybe it could be a P2I12 inhibitor like ticagrelor. And with ticagrelor, we saw that we could shorten the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, keep the patients on with a potent agent for a longer period of time without the hazard of bleeding. And I think it was, um, it was one that then allowed many other investigators to kind of come in here and question the judgment of long-term aspirin for life and, and rethink what should be the antiplatelet of choice for chronic maintenance in patients uh, who have coronary disease and undergo percutaneous coronary intervention. I think the part that we are very, very unclear about and now are designing trials for is what are we doing to keep our bypass grafts open? So since we're with the cardiothoracic surgical group, what are we doing in patients who undergo um, bypass surgery? We have very little data, little evidence on what to do. Do they need dual antiplatelet therapy? Can they have like a a P2Y12 a monotherapy and keep their grafts more patent, especially their vein grafts that seem to have a high closure rate, et cetera. And I, I think um, those studies are now um, undergoing some design and we're working with some of our surgical colleagues to design those because there's an unmet need of understanding what to do with our post-surgical patients in terms of antiplatelet therapies. And I think it's the other part that's very, very important in terms of what we're doing with antiplatelet therapies after um, revascularization, especially percutaneous coronary intervention. I think it's important to also understand in this context that it's not about the stent, it's about the patient and all of the um, atherosclerotic burden that these patients have and that most of these events are not really stent-related events, they're non-stent-related events. Where um, really protecting these patients against spontaneous myocardial infarction and these patients coming in with new lesions that we can't protect. It's not like bypass surgery where you protect the entire vessel. We're only giving um, a stent uh, in a lesion so the entire vessel is not protected. And so we are understanding that. And more and more of the literature and the, and the research now is focused beyond antiplatelet therapies because there's only so much that you could push the envelope in terms of giving these patients more and more stacking, more and more therapies, because you just will cause more bleeding. And so the idea of lipid lowering therapies with PCSK9 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors that also have really, really important protective effects against ischemic events, even though they're diabetic drugs, is it, are the, a huge armamentarium of medical management that we have to pay attention to. And at last but not least, we also have to think about um, a big culprit that many people do not measure and that's LP little a. And now we have uh, clinical trials ongoing in, in reducing LP little a with, uh, with an agent that is now available, but not yet available. It's in a large scale outcome study at the moment, the Horizon 
trial. So there is a lot more to come in terms of what we need to do for ischemic protection of patients who, are, who have coronary disease undergo revascularization. And I think both of us, interventionalists, in the, uh, as well as our cardiac surgeons, have to pay attention to the medical management of these patients. And um, less definitely is more as our patients are becoming more old with many more risk factors. And we've got to really, really be quite judicious in the use of dual antiplatelet therapies and choosing them optimally for our patients. I think they're excellent points. You mean I, I, I mean I think what is really interesting, and you bring up, I mean, this is a very well designed trial, and and I think somewhat, I don't know, uh, maybe unexpected, or maybe the results were a little bit different than people expected. I don't know. The but but I think what really you mean you bring up an important point regarding vein grafts. You know, uh, I think there is. I mean, I I think there would be an interesting hypothesis that really to really see if if long term to antiplatelet therapy could decrease vein graft thrombosis, whether it's in the short term or the long term. You know that is one of the, I think. Uh, uh, you can argue one of the linchpin uh, of 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 cabbages where vein graft go, tend to go down and the patency is you know long term patients of vein graft is questionable. So a lot of that is probably endothelial dysfunction. And so why shouldn't antiplate the therapy, uh, more aggressive antiplate the therapy in a control way uh, modulate that? So I think it's an important question. And I know there are some ideas of trying to study that adequately. There's been some, uh, I think, um, challenges to designing those studies. No, there's no question. I, first of all, I want to say that, um, and I, and, Maybe I'm the oldest person on this <laughs> on this uh, on this Zoom, but I can just tell you that uh, the entire natural history of vein graft pathology has changed over the last three decades. I've been uh, working now in the cath lab for two and a half decades, and um, you know I remember back in the '90s, the late '90s, we would be like struggling with very very thrombotic. Um, extremely ugly looking vein grafts. And in fact, we had to bring in devices for distal protection because anytime we went anywhere near it, it would just be clot everywhere. And it was like cheesecake factory in, in the, uh, in the uh, vein grafts. And we don't see that anymore. We really hardly ever see that. What we see is that the vein graft is just completely occluded. We no longer see the uh, degenerated, ugly looking vein grafts. And I really believe that uh, what has changed over the last two and a half decades, it's really been um, statins. Uh, they're the only drugs that have been now widely used in these patients. And I believe that they've calmed down uh, the inflammatory processes that was going on in those harvested vein grafts and uh, really either they just close because they are uh, vein grafts to non-obstructed lesions because many uh, surgeons feel great when they come out and say, we gave you five grafts. Uh, of course, like three of them were to like non-obstructive lesions, but we were there, we just gave it all, you know, lots and lots of grafts. And, and you wonder if those were just closing because there was competitive flow or for whatever reason, those grafts closed and that it really is not about uh, vein graft itself, the pathobiology. So there is a lot to be learned there. I also think that um, we, uh, our surgical colleagues, I am hoping that they're understanding the importance of total arterial revascularization and how important it is to do everything possible to, to think about total arterial revascularization for our patients. And then of course, um, in, in that context, um, of course, you don't want them to be taking down uh, radials and, and um, internal mammary arteries if, if it's to non-obstructed lesions. So again, I would say the use of imaging before the, um, and understanding are these really um, uh, ischemia producing lesions with hemodynamically significant lesions that need to have, um, bypass grafts to them if you're going to bypass uh, surgery. That's why I believe, again, we come back to the heart team 
and really having that very, very good discussion amongst our surgeons and those in the cath lab that now have great imaging tools to be able to give you a lot of information about what, what kind of blockages we're dealing with. And then of course, a better way of uh, planning the revascularization uh, procedures, whether it's surgical or percutaneous. Um, thank you, Dr. Miran. These, uh, before we jump on to the next trials, there's one question from one of the attendees. Um, they were asking about the duration of three months. Um, and uh, the question was, is that not a very short duration? Well, actually, I think that in presence after, after this trial, uh, remember, this is basically going up. We're not going to aspirin monotherapy. We're going to ticagrelor monotherapy, uh, a, a very, very potent antiplatelet uh, agent that is reversible as well as uh, extremely, uh, you know, er acts uh, very, very quickly. And it gives you a very good um, uh, response uh, to um, platelet aggregation. So uh, obviously, uh, in presence of ticagrelor, we are seeing and showed that aspirin is not doing much more. We, in fact, uh, coupled the, the, the main trial with a very, very detailed um, platelet function study where we looked at uh, blood thrombogenicity with, uh, you know, putting the patient's blood through the Batamon chamber uh, uh, using a porcine aorta and, um, and, and, and were able to microscopically evaluate the area of thrombus and blood thrombogenicity did not change, was not higher in ticagrelor monotherapy compared to ticagrelor plus aspirin. So we really proved by both uh, clinically and biologically and uh, that there was absolutely no benefit. So I actually think that after this study, why three months, why not one month? Uh, why even any amount of aspirin um, if you are, uh, you know, if you're on, and the only reason for it, for the some duration is that some of our patients are not tolerant to ticagrelor and we just can't have them stop it because they're short of breath or they're not feeling good. There are some side effects associated and it's twice a day drug. And we have a hard time with patients keeping up with that. So having aspirin for those first month or three months was good as a sort of a backup plan to make sure that these patients would do well in those, those three months and then be able to be randomized. And believe you me, when I designed this study, many, many IRBs in multitudes of countries denied, how dare you withdraw aspirin in complex patients? And um, so that was then and now here now we're um, stopping it as early as a day or two days. So I think we've gone a long way. Excellent. Yeah, this is a good example how you can, you know, you're challenging, uh, you know, this dual antiplatelet therapy. And I think there was initially people who challenged whether you did need to give DAPI at all, I mean, like, or especially Ticacro or any um, lab, especially for the, as a dual plant therapy after stents. Now it should be the other way around. And do you really need aspirin at all? Basically, it's a good question. I mean, should we maybe give him ticagrelor after all bypass well, instead of aspirin? Before we, before we retire aspirin, before we retire aspirin, and I get letters from Bayer, and I, I did get those letters, before we do anything like that, we would need a major study. Remember, this is a select patient group. Always take the, the, the clinical trial you're looking at in the context of the patients who are enrolled in these, in these trials. Remember, you had to pass a stress test of three months on aspirin and ticagrelor and have no events. And then you were qualified to randomize in this study. So please make sure you read the study and that you take it. Don't go home tomorrow and just send your patient home on ticagrelor. And then God forbid they stop taking it and call Roxana that, oh, you told us we, we could go uh, alone. No, no please. Uh, read the paper and use it. Uh, the twilight strategy is for the patients that were like twilight patients and uh, tolerated. And by the way, there are multi multiple, my colleagues from around the world are now 
designing studies in um, STEMI, actually, I'm on a data safety monitoring board of a clinical trial that is taking STEMI patients and after a month is um, stopping the, um, uh, the aspirin in these patients. So it's, it's gonna happen, but not yet, please, until we get. Excellent, all right, thank you very much. We'll jump on. Um, we have about 20 minutes left here. We'll jump on quickly to the uh, mitral trials. I have two of them to present. Um, for the, in the interest of time, I will lump them together and then we'll have a conversation about both of them. Um, so the first trial I have here is the primary trial. This is a prospective multicenter open label randomized trial comparing mitral valve transcatheter edge to edge repair to surgical repair. Uh, patients were randomized in a one to one ratio. In patients with primary degenerative mitral regurgitation, it's being conducted in several countries, and um, it includes all devices that are currently being legally marketed for transcatheter edge to edge repair of primary degenerative mitral regurgitation um, and whatever devices being used in the countries being um, used in this trial. The inclusion criteria several basically adult patients with moderate to severe, severe primary degenerative MR by Carpentier um, classification on TTE, um, patients who have a clinical indication for mitral valve uh, intervention and are suitable candidates anatomically for both transcatheter and surgical repair as determined by the local heart team and um, includes patients of across all surgical risk risks, uh, including low, intermediate, high-risk patients. And it also includes patients with atrial fibrillation who meet an indication for concomitant ablation, uh, which may be provided by the local heart team uh, in a catheter-based uh, fashion or you know, together with the surgical mitral valve um, repair and their ability to complete a um, functional test and their quality of life as determined by the KCCQ um, um, instrument. Um, I omitted the exclusion criteria. There are several, but uh, some key ones to highlight there um, include patients that have um, other forms of mitral regurgitation, such as cleft leaflet or endocarditis, also patients with secondary functional MR and other concomitant um, cardiac disease like uh, Hocum hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or um, patients that um, have uh, coronary artery disease. There, there are a lot of other uh, fine criteria, but going back to the outcomes, the primary outcome of primary is all-cause mortality, valve reintervention, um, hospitalizations, and urgent visits, uh, or the onset of three plus MR. Um, the composite score for that over a period of three years is the primary outcome. Other outcomes being assessed by this trial are the adequacy of mitral regurgitation correction at one year post-intervention and how um, patient's quality of life um, evolves up to 10 years post-intervention, the incidence of procedure failure at the end of their, uh, their, their procedure and also all-cause mortality. There's some other echo parameters looking at uh, LV remodeling that are also being assessed as secondary outcomes. Um, so that is the first uh, primary trial that um, I will present and I will jump on to the next trial, which is similar um, to primary, but this is the um, repair mitral trial, which is um, designed to evaluate the clinical outcomes of mitral clip device versus surgical repair in patients with severe primary MR or at moderate surgical risk and whose mitral valve has been determined to be suitable for correction by local heart team. Um, the inclusion criteria for this trial are somewhat similar. Um, the patients are severe mitral, uh, severe primary MR patients. Um, and 
Um, mixed etiology is also acceptable in this trial, um, provided the principal me mechanism of action is degenerative mitral disease. And um, the local heart team have determined that the patient is a suitable candidate for either surgery or percutaneous repair. And the subject is symptomatic or asymptomatic with uh, EF less than 60%, PA pressure greater than 50, and left ventricular and systolic dimension more than diameter more than 40, and they're at moderate surgical risk. Um, the outcomes being evaluated by repair, the primary outcome is all cause mortality, um, stroke, hospitalization, or acute AKI, basically uh, requiring treatment at two years. Um, and any cardiac hospitalization within the first 30 years post-treatment will be excluded in this trial. The other primary outcome of this trial is a proportion of subjects with moderate or less MR, less than two plus, um, uh, without mitral valve replacement and without recurrent mitral valve reintervention over a period of two years. Um, the secondary outcomes are several as were for primary. There's somewhat similar. Um, they look at quality of life in this trial also and um, the incidence of severe symptomatic mitral stenosis at one year, um, as well as proportion of patients with MR less than mild at 30 days post-index procedure. So that's a brief overview of the trials. Um, I'll start with my first question to Dr. Gerson. Um, there's a lot to process here for um, someone that's not familiar with these trials. Um, brief, what are the key differences between the, these two trials in terms of their design and um, what are they trying to show? Well, I think these are very important trials. You mean uh, with the, you know, transcatheter edge to edge therapy, you know, the cat is kind of out of the bag uh, with, uh, I think, uh, not that the greatest evidence of someone ejected. So it's going to be really important to get information on the patients who are indeed uh, less than high risk uh, 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 for primary regurgitation, uh, you know, so mitral regurgitation, primary mitral regurgitation, secondary to general mitral valve disease or mitral valve prolapse. And, you know, they're, they're, I think there are key differences in these trials, you know, first of all, repair MR. Uh, I, I think the, so a lot of the criticism have been brought up for that is that it, it is designed as a non-inferiority trial. And uh, I, I guess we probably don't have to go over all the details of that, but, you know, uh, there are, uh, one can argue we should have been better to design as a superiority trial, you know, uh, but, you know, I think people can go back and forth about that. You know, the, uh, I don't have time to go over all that specifically related to non-inferior trials, but the, uh, the margins that are set have to be predefined. And they, within that margin, you can sometimes have even actually superior or actually not, uh, in, you know, or uh, these traditional uh, or uh, method is could could actually be better depending on exactly how it's defined. So, uh, but it still is an important trials. The other one, um, you know, the primary trial is uh, includes all patients who are above, uh, you know, who are uh, undergoing, uh, uh, you know, also low risk patients. One of the major criticisms has been done for that is that one of the outcomes is the degree of MR. Uh, is more than three, uh, so moderate, uh, more than moderate, basically. So, which indicates that, uh, and I, and I do believe that that was put in place because there was a lot of hesitancy for interventional or structural interventionalists to participate in the trials, based on that, and and uh, and and I do believe that might be changed, basically. But that has been a major criticism from from surgeons because I guess I wouldn't be happy if I had a mitral valve repair that three years after the operation had, you know, there was a significant portion who had, uh, you know, not, you know, more than moderate MR. I mean, I consider that a major failure, uh, right. uh, but, you know, is moderate, but this, this would include moderate. Moderate would be considered a success, but even moderate from a surgical standpoint is probably not a success. So, 
But I do believe these trials are very important. It'll be really interesting to see how they pan out, what the results will be. They will hopefully provide us with how we treat those patients. Do they undergo transcatheter repair or surgical repair? I mean, I think uh, there's been a lot of criticism from edge to edge repair. It's not really treating the whole physiology crop properly. We've done the Alfieri stitch so many times and it doesn't work. But you know, I think this is, uh, you know, and pushing the envelope and trying new therapy is very important. Uh, you know, the times are different when Alfieri designed or was doing his, these, these, his, his surgical techniques. Um, I mean, we got to, you know, uh, uh, move. Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, as I said, I think I, I, another thing I wanted to point out, I think it is important. And then and, uh, you know, surgeons are held to pretty high standards for mitral valve repairs. I mean, if you consider yourself to be a mitral valve surgeon and you have, I don't know, 10, 10 20% failure rate a couple years out, I mean, you're not going to get more mitral valves sent to you for repairs. And, and, and structural cardiologists need to be trained and held to the same standard, you know, and I'm hopeful that those tri these trials will demonstrate that in excellent hand, you can do an excellent mitral valve operation and excellent mitral cord in properly selected patients. Happy to take more questions, I'll give the, the, you know, maybe Dr. Grubb will have some uh, uh, interesting points with us. No, I think I agree. Um, let me, I'm switching phones. Um, there we go. So sorry about that. Um, I have a dying computer. Um, so the the question here is is the patient selection and the designs of the trial. I think that you, the well established um, surgical um, results are are going to speak for themselves. The following the patients for long enough to see whether or not moderate mitral regurgitation is problematic, is also an important endpoint um, and something that we, we will be learning um, from both of these studies. And so I, I think in these, in these patients, we have to be careful because it's not going to be all primary MR. It's going to be basically your A2P2 that's going to have equipoise between mitral clip and surgery to um, be held to those standards. So these are not gonna be Barlow's patients. These are not going to be um, patients with clefts as, as was mentioned. And so we are talking about a very, very defined patient population where we may find that, that they are exactly the same. Um, and, and I think that that's an important, um, or in, in the, the case of uh, repair mark, non-inferior, um, it's an important thing for us to understand now, particularly because Mitra clip is such a safe procedure. If it was a risky procedure, I think that we would not be able to have this conversation yet, but it's a safe procedure um, and has been shown to be fairly efficacious. So I, I think it's time to do this study. It'll be interesting to see the results. It'll be interesting to see what happens if the two studies end up with different results. Roxana? I, I mean, it's hard to um, add to any more any more uh, good words than what you've already done. I mean, I think it's exactly correct. Uh, I really don't have any added comments to that. I mean, I agree with what everyone says. It's just hard to think that, you know, if we see mild MR after repair, mild to moderate, anything like that, Dr. Adam immediately goes back on bypass and corrects wherever we see the leak. So. Um, like you all were saying, we expect really perfection of the results with mitral repair. So, I mean, how is this heart team discussion going to occur if you have a patient who, you know, could benefit from a clip, but they're young and they're a surgical candidate? I mean, what other factors would you look at to refer to either a repair surgeon or, you know, the uh, structural uh, cardiology team? Yeah, I mean, I think, Sophia, let me just make sure we're, we're really talking about the same thing, okay? I mean, I think there's no question that, uh, you know, mitral valve repair by a fantastic surgeon and a young patient is the absolute best possible way forward. I don't think that there are people going around clipping mitral valves, and if they are, then that would be atrocious and awful in young patients who are excellent surgical candidates. So I don't even think this is a question because at the moment, you know, 
we need to really understand in the context of how mitral clip has come forth is in the context of the COAP trial, which was for the for for the sickest patients with severe mitral regurgitation with functional MR, who mm -hmm. were not really great. It was against medical management. This has nothing to do with what David Adams is doing in 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 the OR, uh, repairing a, a prolapse valve of a young woman with mitral valve prolapse and P2 prolapse. That's a whole different story. Now, having said that, the transcatheter approaches are coming forth for uh, the repair or replacement of the mitral valve. And some of these are, uh, none of them will be as great as what a surgeon can do in terms of sculpting and truly repairing a valve with the anatomical differences that we see in the mitral process. Uh, 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 in the mitral valve, as opposed to any other valve, an extremely complex with, with an apparatus to deal with and everything else that, that comes forth. It's not just about a clip that takes care of the regurgitation. That is, I, I think many understand that very, very well. Now, in the context of um, where we are with uh, mitral valve um, uh transcatheter mitral valve uh, uh, programs, I think it is, it, again, once again, is something to be, to be evaluated long-term. But at the moment, let's understand a young patient with you know, mitral valve disease uh, who's amenable to surgery, we need to find a good mitral valve surgeon who is able to repair rather than replace the valve. We know that Repair is probably better than replacing that valve. And uh, hopefully that is the best way that we're proceeding in that direction. Uh, but I think there's much more to come in this arena. This one is more complicated. The highways are much, much more um, rockier and need better pavement, if you will. So we've got a long way to go until we get to that level. So don't worry about Dr. Adams. And your <laughs> Right. No, no, I mean, definitely. I think the technology will be interesting to see how it involves with if there's percutaneous annual plasty techniques, et cetera. Yeah, no, and, and I, don't, I don't think that, you know, uh, I, I think do I mean, you know, edge-to-edge you know, -edge therapy is probably not the whole solution, but, you know, these things will really help develop different techniques and understanding also, you know, really the effect of residual MR, I mean, this is going to be well, both are designed of a very good echocardiographic follow-up for both clips and surgeries. Uh, so I think it will provide us with important information. Uh, I think I would recommend all the, I mean, one thing that came up and has been brought up recently, I mean, there was a great paper here about the, you know, kind of developing a new risks uh, model for patient undergo primary Repair for primary MR by, by Winnie Bodwar, who's uh, both in Jack and uh, and Annals, and I would encourage everybody to read that. But because uh, at, at high volume mitral valve centers, mortality risk for uh, for repair, however you do it, is extremely low, and and even mass majority of centers actually had zero mortality, surgical mortality. So that has to be kept in mind when you're designing these type of trials. And that included everybody, you know, all age groups. So uh, when these designs are trial, when the results are interpreted later on. So, but these, these are, this is gonna be really interesting how it comes out. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of criticism in either directions, but so, but as long as we can interpret it and get some good information, I think we'll move the field forward. Awesome. Uh, we're almost at the hour mark uh, before we, wind up just a final question for um, everyone, Dr. Gerson, uh, Dr. Grubb, Dr. Maron, um, for since this is a webinar aimed at residents and um, fellows in training, uh, people that are currently undergoing training and looking at all of these therapeutic options out there, surgical options and um, now emerging transcatheter options, which um, you know we're unclear how the field will be evolving in the upcoming years. What advice would you give to a resident listening to this conversation um, regarding how they pursue these training options in their institution and how do they navigate 
hard team discussions. So I will start that. Um, I would say keep your seat at the table. Um, I, I think that the, one of the mistakes that the surgical community has made is not being engaged enough and having surgeons involved in all of these conversations. When Dr. Moran spoke, you could hear that she had a good understanding of what to expect from her surgical colleagues. And some of that is based on years and years and years of sending patients to surgeons and getting good results. I don't know that there are surgeons you're, that out there that are the ones that are not part of a heart team. Um, I'm not sure that they understand the capability like MitraClip or TMVR. And so in order to stay in this space, to be a, a structuralist per se, whether you're just doing surgery or you do transcatheter and surgery for the surgeons out there, you need to keep your seat at the table, come to the heart team, learn what the devices are capable of, learn the echo um, anatomy that is appropriate for clips and have be able to have an in, um, intelligent conversation about the risks and benefits of each of the procedures and the capabilities of each. There are going to be centers where they have excellent um, tier operators and maybe not as strong of a surgeon. If that surgeon is doing mostly replacements, those patients may be better off with tier. And so you need to have that conversation to understand what is available for our patients so that they can participate and share decision-making. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I think I, 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 I'm, uh, I think surgery, I mean, every training needs to learn to be a part of these operations and see and understand, you know, whether that's tier or especially TAVERS, and they need to be part of these uh, heart care meetings. I think most of the training program probably do that. It's major medical academic centers. Uh, this is a very important part of our practice. And the future of valve intervention, structural intervention is, is, is gonna be more and more transcatheter device. So we need to be involved. Whether you, I do also believe in super specialization. I think there needs, you know, in order for you to uh, have a real seat at the table, like, you know, you need to understand how to really do this operation and be able to do part of the operation. So you need to do extra training. You know, you need to do super extra fellowship in, uh, in uh in structural and 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 you know and it doesn't have to be everybody uh but we 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 gotta avoid this kind of uh us uh, covering hospitals doing tavers where surgeons just sit in the uh, the the control room or having coffee somewhere and not be an integral part of this stuff i mean eventually probably there won't be a requirement for having surgeon uh, or, or cardiologists doing the procedures together. I hope there will be some time until that phase away, but there's probably no reason eventually in some of those procedures that either one or the others do it. And that applies both for, you know, TIER and TAVERS. I mean, TAVERS requires both surgeon and structural cardiologists to be in, you know, a, a mitral clip, it could be one or the other. Uh, there's not a requirement for it, but I mean, there are surgeons who do them, them also. So I don't know, you really need to be involved. You need to get exposure during your training. Um, and, and, and a certain person needs to super specialize to be in structural surgeons. All right. Well, thank you so much to our panelists for the provocative conversation. We really appreciate you taking time out of your night, uh, Drs. Moran, Grubb, and Gearson. And um, it'll be interesting to see what the results of uh, some of these trials are in the next uh, coming years. All right, thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. you very much, everyone. Thank you for joining.